Okay, welcome everyone to our presentation this evening. Uh, my name is Doreen Heinemann. I'm the Executive FC Administrator for the Sash Bear Foundation. Um, the Sash Bear Foundation in Canada uh, works toward advocacy, awareness, and education around emotion dysregulation and suicide prevention. Um, and one of our main activities is delivering the Family Connections Program for family members of those with emotion dysregulation. Um, I'm pleased to welcome this evening Adina Hauser, who is from the Toronto, um, what's it now called? Toronto Hospital, Toronto East Hospital Network, I think. <laughs> yeah, Michael Guerin Hospital. Yeah. And she works at Michael Guerin Hospital um, in Toronto, Ontario. She's a social worker with uh, lots of experience and expertise in dealing with youth and families. And um, this evening, she will be speaking to us about substance use and harm reduction with youth. Um, I just want to remind you that this is a webinar, so none of the rest of you are appearing on camera. And also to let you know that this will be recorded. So if you need to leave before we're finished, um, you're welcome to view the recording. It'll be on our website and our YouTube channel within the next couple of weeks. Um, we will have an hour with Adina making presentation this evening, and then another half an hour for her to answer questions. She's generously agreed to stay with us until 8.30. So if you would like to put your questions into the Q&A box, um, then that will ensure that we see them and we will try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, you can also use the chat throughout the evening if you would like to post questions there. Um, I also just want to let you know that I'm joined this evening by Lizanne and Kathleen, who are also volunteers with the Sash Bear Foundation, and they will be helping me at the end with the questions and also with the chat throughout the evening. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Adina Hauser. Thank you, Adina, for joining us this evening. Thank you very much for having me. And I'm really glad to, to be back uh, to talk with you again tonight, uh, more about substance use, use and youth, um, and really to focus tonight on the idea of harm reduction um, and strategies uh, for supporting someone who's using substances. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, so we're going to talk, I'm going to talk uh, very briefly about substance use disorders. I, um, I, you may have seen my previous talk and I did talk more about it. I don't want to spend too much time today on that. Um, talking about youth development as well. Um, I'm really going to focus tonight on the idea, idea of stages of change and strategies for families uh, in different stages of readiness when it comes to making change to substance use harm reduction and communication strategies for loved ones and family members, and then limit setting within a harm reduction framework. And then, um, as it was said, open it up to, to questions. Okay, so uh, I'm going to really briefly um, talk about what is a substance use disorder. And I think this is important because we have to be able to differentiate between substance use that is not problematic and substance use that is problematic. There is a lot of substance use that is experimental. Most youth experiment with substances and not every youth who uses becomes addicted and develops problems as a result of their use. Um, so we wanted to show you what uh, we define as a substance use disorder, that it's a pattern of symptoms resulting from use of a substance, which an individual continues to take despite experiencing problems as a result. And in order to meet criteria for a substance use disorder, you need to meet some or more of these different criteria. Um, we we'll talk about using a substance more or longer than you mean to, wanting to cut down but struggling, spending a lot of time getting, using, or recovering from substances, experiencing cravings or urges to use, um, not managing to meet other obligations, um, continuing to use even if it causes problems, giving up other activities or other priorities because of your use, using substances again and again, even with risk, continuing to use even if your other problems get worse, needing more, so building tolerance and experiencing withdrawal. You don't need to meet all of these criteria, um, but you need to meet some of them uh, to have a, a substance use disorder. So I wanted to, to put that out there really to frame our, our discussion today when we talk about harm reduction and making change to substance use. 
So I'm not going to spend time on this, but just again to highlight that most people who use substances experiment with use. The, the, the lowest number of people um, have physical dependency or addiction issues uh, when it comes to, to substance use. So why does, um, why does it matter that we're talking about substance use? Because it has a real effect uh, psychologically, um, physically, on our bodies. Um, when we use a substance, uh, any sort of drug, it attaches to the dopamine receptors in our brain and releases dopamine. Dopamine is a feel-good chemical. It's a motivating chemical. It, it, um, it, it, it is a good thing that our brain experiences. And so the more that we use, the more our brains like that feeling and want to prioritize that the, the release of dopamine from drugs over other sensations. And we start to develop cues or triggers or associations in our brain. Um, and our brain can even start to release dopamine just from thinking about using um, even before we use. And that really solidifies the association. So we may start off using in an experimental way or with choice, but if a number of factors sort of converge to um, make us use more and more and more, and I'll talk about what those factors are, um, it makes it harder to disassociate um, substance use from also what our brain wants and what our brain thinks about. Um, and that sometimes can make it really hard to change. So I, last time we talked, uh, I went through some of the tasks for youth of going through adolescence and becoming an adult. And I, I just want to review quickly what some of these developmental tasks are, because it really sets the stage for a lot of the conversations that we have around change, about our relationships with a young person, around some of the difficulties they go through. And everything that happens to an adolescent or a young adult in this in this period of time is in service of practicing to become a full-fledged adult. It's the way our brain develops, it's the choices that we make, it's the, the pull of certain things and tasks over others, is our brain is getting ready, it's practicing for independence from parents or caregivers, um, and it has to try out lots of different ways to being to become an independent coping brain. Um, and so it prioritizes risk and novelty and um, our, our emotion center, our, our emotion brain is really over firing and our rational brain is under firing. And this really all helps someone become an independent adult where they can't rely on other people or um, or you know, caregivers to do that coping, to do that, that experiential learning for them. Now, youth don't have long-term life experience. And so sometimes it's a bad combination of some of the risks that youth need to take to get ready for adulthood and some of the consequences that they run into because they don't have sort of the long view of their lives and how to do that safely. So, why do youth use substances? We, we can't look at substance use and say simply that it is a bad choice. There are lots of times and reasons why youth may use substances to help um, or as a function of something to support something in their lives. So they may use to experience pleasure or enhancement, but they also may use to manage mental health symptoms, underlying mental health symptoms, struggles with confidence and friends. Um, it may be a way that they communicate a message to other people. It may be a world that they know that substance use is really pervasive and it feels like the reality that they're walking into no matter what. And, and the reason I stress this is because we spend a lot of time focusing on negative consequences of use, but the truth is there are lots of positive things, lots of ways that substance um, substances can help, even if it comes with risk and, and consequence. And it's really important to ensure that we're making space to understand that about, about young people just as much as we understand some of the negative consequences around using. 
Um, we know that there's a relationship between substance use and mental health. I saw a statistic today um, that somewhere around 60%, and I actually thought it was higher, um, youth who have mental health issues also struggle with their substance use. I can tell you anecdotally from the work that I've done is that any youth that I've encountered who's have substance use concerns has also had mental health concerns. And we know that sometimes they play, uh, they have a relationship with each other that can look different. They can make one worse. Um, a substance use disorder can exacerbate a mental health problem or a mental health problem can make substance use worse. They can trigger one another. They can mimic one another. So, you know, withdrawal may look like a mental health issue, but it's really withdrawal and they can hide one another. Substance use can hide a lot of underlying mental health concerns that people have. And sometimes that's another reason why youth may use is to conceal or to cover or to find relief from underlying mental health issues that no one else knows about. We know that there are lots of risk factors that youth experience um, that may put them at risk of using substances. We know that early trauma, early loss can sometimes play a part. We know that um, if youth start using early on, if they have a lower maturity, that sometimes puts them at risk for substance use problems. We know that things like cultural and social inequities and racism put um, youth at risk for substance use. We know that temperament can sometimes impact whether someone uses substances to cope. And low distress tolerance often can play a part um, because substance use is often used as a coping mechanism uh, for distress. I, I really like to um, frame this in a way that sort of how um, it's kind of the nature versus nurture debate, right? It's that sometimes our risk factors or, or whether we use or how well we feel really depends on a combination of what we come into the world with, what we encounter as we grow. So what we might come into the world with a particular temperament, plus or minus our environment or relationships, what we encounter, and then how we cope with it. Do we cope well? Do we cope poorly? Do we, have, we learn to avoid? And then that has an impact on our well-being, our growth, our, our development into adulthood, our self-identity, all of those things. Um, and I, I think this is really important because it sometimes ex it, it helps us understand some of the reasons why we learn to cope the way that we do or why we may be more at risk than others. And I want to give you an example to sort of map this out. So what we come into the world with might be a temperament. So for instance, I may be a natural externalizer, which means that I process my emotions on the outside, not the inside. Um, that may make me into the kind of person who seeks out thrills or um, is a bit impulsive or um, you know, tries on lots of different experiences. And maybe that, that means I get in trouble a lot at school. So now we're talking about what we encounter. I get in trouble a lot at home or school. Maybe I'm even diagnosed with ADHD or ODD. Um, and if something happens to me, something bad happens to me, then maybe the way that I cope because I process my emotions on the outside is to um, avoid or use substances or get in fights. And that sort of starts to tell me how the impact on my well being, how well I'm going to do it, it will define how people will look at me. Externalizers tend to be punished for this. What if I'm an internalizer? My temperament is more of an anxious temperament, and I, which means I process my emotions on the inside, not the outside. Um, I Maybe I experience trauma or other challenges, or I fly under the radar with some learning challenges because I'm quiet and I don't ask and I don't kind of act out. Maybe it gets missed, maybe it gets ignored. And um, maybe I have problems as a result in other relationships. Maybe my mood, um, my mood is low. Maybe I get labeled as dramatic or sensitive, right? Um, and, and I become more prone to using maybe substances or other coping aids as a way to self-medicate, right? Because I process my emotions on the inside. So now I'm going to use something that's going to change the way that I feel on the inside. And you know what? We don't punish those, those people. We reward them with counseling. We tend to punish externalizers. We tend to reward internalizers. And so 
the combination of nature versus nurture and how we learn to cope all have an impact on, on how we do. And this is not a, a, a causation argument that I'm making, but just simply to help us see that um, the things that we come into the world with and then how we're perceived and how we're, we're supported and how um, we manage with what we are met with, it all has um, an impact on how we do. And that's really where substance use sort of falls into the category of how we cope um, because we may use it to self-medicate. We may use it to um, push people away or avoid or ignore our feelings. Um, we know that substance use can affect our development. So um, one thing that happens is sort of the earlier we use and the more mental health struggles we have, we may, we're at risk of developing abnormal um, stress pathways. So we don't learn how to deal with stress effectively. And that follows us into adulthood. It could impact our executive functioning and our prefrontal cortex development, which we know develops much later on in the brain. We're at risk of developing major mental illness. We're at risk of addiction. Um, and we may be at risk of having um, altered pleasure pathways. So more uh, emphasis on dopamine release from substances than from other activities, let's say hockey or being with friends, um, that we might prioritize the feeling that we get from substances over other, other activities that may have been pleasurable. So there can be a major effect of substance use on our development. Um, one of the things that's really important to note is that the way that someone who's young copes will look different than how we cope as adults because their brain is still developing. Don't forget, there's lots of limbic system happening, lots of emotion and very little prefrontal cortex, right? When we're starting to develop um, our brains, our adult brains. So there's lots of impulsivity. So we're sort of primed to have to rely on other things to help us manage um, because we don't have the internal working structure up and running yet that may help us cope on our own. We sort of normalize this in society. And I, I talked about this in the last talk, you know, that we um, use phones and social media and TV as a distraction and food as a distraction and substances. And there's lots of things that we use to help us avoid learning how to manage things for ourselves. And, and a lot of those things are normalized in society. So it's not entirely a young person's fault that they're sort of primed to avoid using other things. We do it too. We just expect sometimes that they should be different. So one of the things that's really important, I think, to consider is how we develop avoidance. And this has really strong correlations with why we continue to use substances in problematic ways. Um, what happens is we experience an emotional trigger. That's the bottom left corner of the triangle. And we start to experience distress or distress grows. And what typically happens is our distress grows and it peaks, right? It's the worst it feels. And then, and then eventually that feeling starts to go away or we calm down or we cope. Um, and then that emotion trigger goes away or it changes, it becomes something else or we've moved on. Um, and there's sort of two points that we tend to intervene. Either we find ourselves in the avoidance sweet spot and we intervene then. So right as I'm starting to feel bad, I do something to help myself avoid. I use a substance, I uh, get in a fight with someone, I you know distract myself. And there's also the point where we have a learning opportunity, which is once we've actually passed the peak of, of the most intense emotion. And what that does is it teaches our brain, you can feel badly and you can feel the worst. And you also can know that that feeling goes away and that feeling changes. And unless we give our brains lots of experience of not intervening to get rid of our feelings until the descent, um, we don't learn. Our brains don't learn that we can get through our emotions. And so every emotion we feel tends to feel bigger and worse and worse. And we tend to get more and more scared that we're not going to get through this. And guess what happens? We rely more and more on substances or other avoidance strategies because it's the only thing that will help us feel better when we don't think we're going to make it through to the end of that feeling. And this is sort of how our avoidance strategies keep um, keep perpetuating this uh, this experience or this cycle. So 
we, why do we use, let's say emotional aids I'm calling them avoidance or substance use mainly because we don't have the confidence or the skills to cope on our own with our emotional pain or distress. And usually these come with increased risk for sure. And usually the behavior around it is the most noticeable to others, but the why, the why do I use is rarely communicated with others. And that's, I think really, really where I want us to focus today is shifting our, our emphasis as a loved one from just the behavior to the why, because the why is where we actually have the most impact to be able to help and support someone, not in the behavior. But because the behavior is the loudest and most obvious, it's usually where most of us get stuck. So substance use is the attempt at a solution. It's no one signs up for a life of pain and distress and suffering and withdrawal and all of that. We usually get stuck using substances because we're attempting to solve a problem that maybe works in the short term, but usually exacerbates the pain in the long term. Um, and as loved ones, our support and our effort needs to be aimed at understanding this, not just policing it. So moving again from the behavior to the why. Um, so I, I'm, I, I included some quotes that uh, if you go back and, and watch the recording after, you can spend some time on, but um, I love Mark Lewis and his books, and he talks about how hard it is to make change. Um, he's a neuropsychologist who also has a long history of addiction. And he talks about how much we focus on the change, but how hard it is and how exhausting it is to keep holding on and to keep changing every single time uh, we feel triggered or we feel we have difficulty. So I want to spend a bit of time on the idea of stages of change. I did talk about it in my last talk. Um, the stages of change is a theoretical model that we use in lots of things, but especially in addiction, to describe the different phases that people are in when it comes to thinking about or making change. Um, and people generally sort of shift not in a linear way, not in a straight way, from one stage to the next. And we'll go through sort of each of the stages and what we notice about young people's behavior and, and their um, thought process at each stage of change. Um, but anytime we're trying to make, you know, think about any change that you've made in your life, you sort of go from this place of not thinking about it, not seeing the importance of making the change to starting to consider why that might be useful or, or why there, there might be some value in changing that behavior. At some point, we start to get ready for the change, so we're in preparation. And at some point, we start putting into place goals to make that change. And then at some point, we've made it and we're busy trying to maintain it. And really, what this what this picture shows us is that at lots of points, um, we might resist, and I don't like the word resist, but we might have ambivalence towards the change. So we may be thinking about it, but then because of our ambivalence, we may not want to. And we might slip, I like to use the word slip instead of relapse, that we might slip into a previous day of, stage of change, or maybe we've made a change, like I've started going to the gym, but then I, you know, I get really busy at work, <clears throat> and I and I stop and I haven't gone to the gym for a month. And so um, the way that we sort of act out our change uh, may change over time. Um, and so I, I just want to ask this question to keep in your mind as we go through the different stages of change. Um, to think about your mindset, if you think about one thing that you've changed, or even just thinking about your loved one and a big change you want them to make, let's say with their substance use. Um, What's your mindset at that stage and what would have been most helpful or least helpful for you? And if you're thinking about your loved ones change, what stage are they in and what stage are you in? And I want you to keep those questions in your mind as, as we're talking about the different stages of change. So the pre-contemplation stage is usually the stage where, um, you know, we call it the I'll, I'll live with it stage where youth really aren't thinking about the need to make a change. It's not on their radar or it's not something that they're articulating. Um, and a lot of youth that we see, you know, in substance use treatment are in pre-contemplation. They're using and they're not so interested in making a change or they don't, um, again, see the value in making the change. And that's usually because the risk of changing outweighs the risk of staying the same. 
So it might feel worse to make a change or they think it's gonna feel worse than it is to stay the same no matter what. So they'll live with it. Um, there's a lot of fear in making change. It's really hard to think. Um, hard to imagine whether something will work or not. Like if I give up my substance use, will I feel better? Will I feel worse? And so sometimes it's easier not to think of it at all and stay in pre-contemplation. Sometimes our mental health needs are really high and they're, they take precedent over the desire to change our substance use. Um, and this is often the stage where, you know, you'll hear things from your, your loved ones like, I don't want to go to treatment. I don't need help you're forcing me, I don't have a problem. These are some of the things you might hear. If they do go to treatment, they're going for you, not for them. Um, it's not really on their, um, their to-do list to make a change. And so the tasks for youth during pre-contemplation are really to um, acknowledge the existence of a problem and really to just experience the natural consequences of their choices um, and to manage risk as it comes up. And for, for a caregiver, um, it's not very effective to focus on education. Uh, talking about too much about education, so what's good and what's bad about substance use or why someone should change, um, it's not really going to be heard. And if you, know, you want to avoid nagging, avoid demanding, avoid problem solving, if you are arguing for all the reasons that someone should change if they're in pre-contemplation, in order for them to balance you out, they're going to argue for all of the reasons to stay the same. And you're gonna see a lot of tension and oppositionality. So it's very ineffective to really argue for change when someone's in pre-contemplation. What is much more effective is allowing natural consequences to occur, helping to manage safety, focus on engaging and supporting your loved one, um, tolerating the risks that they have and helping them sort out their mental health. And some of the challenges we, we notice when youth are in pre-contemplation is they struggle, they, they are struggling. There are more risks. They don't wanna to go to treatment. They may not talk to you about what's going on. There's no change happening. And for, for parents and for caregivers you really have to adjust your expectations about change happening uh, when you're in pre-contemplation. Contemplation is really the stage where youth are starting to consider that there might be reasons or values in changing. Um, it's where they're starting to sort out their mixed feelings about their use. They may talk about um, change a bit more. You might hear things like, it works for me most of the time. I don't know why I have to go see the therapist or I don't know what to do, or even that it helps me with my anxiety and, and even statements like I can't imagine my life without it. And you can sort of hear the difference, right? That there's, it's not this absolute, there, there's a part of them that, that might be open to hearing the other side, um, but that they're ambivalent. And you may hear that vague <clears throat> talk about change, but um, you, you probably won't hear so much about the parts that aren't working. Um, you, you have to infer that a little bit, um, but you, you start to hear those cracks about change. Um, and so their goals really in a contemplation stage are to start to weigh the pros and cons of change and of use. And your task as a caregiver is to support those mixed feelings, help them weigh them out, work on that readiness, and again, support them with any underlying mental health issues. And some of the challenges are that they still struggle, right? Big change hasn't happened. And that speed and focus of the recovery can be really slow. And you may see some flip-flopping sort of between contemplation and pre-contemplation, maybe a little bit of readiness, but you might see some flip-flopping because youth are really uncertain at this stage. Preparation is when um, you're going to hear more change talks. So you're going to hear things like, um, I want to, I need to, I'm ready to. Um, and this is when they're starting to imagine what change could look like and maybe think about action plans. They may start to be tracking their use at this point to be more mindful of what they're using. They might even pick some goals. And this is really where um, treatment becomes more effective. And for you as a caregiver, you want to support all of that change talk um, and 
you know, assist in any help seeking opportunities. I liken this stage to, you know, if you're about to climb a mountain, no one climbs straight up the mountain um, that we do much better when we weave around, uh, when we plan for the climb, when we pack the things that we need, we, um, you know, we, we, involve other people in our climb we plan for bad weather and bumps in the road so this is really that stage where you're doing all of that mountain climbing preparation right you're preparing for if things got worse and, and what you might do about it um, but knowing that recovery really isn't linear linear and you may find the weaving around the mountain takes a lot longer than you hoped for uh, or that felt realistic to you Action is when this is where the change is happening. You may hear things like, I'm excited, I'm making changes, I did it. Can you help me get rid of my stash? Guess what, I threw out my bong. Things like that, you might hear a lot more change talk. Um, you might see some real changes in their social relationships. Um, and you may see more isolation and loneliness as they start to actually reflect the changes that they've made. It changes their, their social life. They may spend more time at home, um, but they may feel more isolated and lonely. And this is where you start to notice more mental health issues. So we said that substance use is often a solution for an underlying problem. And sometimes that's mental health. And you may see actually more exacerbation of mental health once you take away some of the substance use and whatever it was covering up. So for yourself as a caregiver, the goal is really to help them go slowly, go carefully, not get too excited, help them put the brakes on where necessary and really support both the mental health and the changes that they're making. And um, you may notice that they may feel frustrated if they slip. They, you may feel helpless if there are consequences to that slip and that change continues to be really slow and non-linear. Those are some of the challenges we have even in the action stage. And the maintenance stage is really about when change is more routine at this point, um, you may feel excited about the new normal. Um, it can be a really good feeling, but there can also be a lot of fear about slipping back um, and not being able to maintain their changes. This is where actually a lot of you feel really bored because they've made a lot of changes. They've lost a lot. There's a lot of loss. Um, they don't feel the same dopamine rush from other activities that they did from drugs, right? Drugs sort of is the quickest and fastest way to get a dopamine um, release. Other activities don't happen as effectively, so they may feel a lot more bored. Um, and I think this is really important as a caregiver or as a loved one um, that you're engaging with them so much at this stage. You know, we get excited that things are calmer and we and sometimes we uh, leave too much space when really youth continue to need a lot of support at this stage. Um, don't you don't want to leave the gap too big because youth can start to question if there's a lot of loss and a lot of isolation and boredom and loneliness and all of those feelings, they might start to question why they made that change. So this is a really wonderful opportunity to engage them, to support them, to validate, to normalize a lot of the things that they're feeling. Um, sometimes pressure to keep up the changes can result in lying and it's something to be aware of that they may be slipping and they may be afraid to tell you and they may be concealing some things that are happening to them um, and so it's really important to normalize these slips they're learning opportunities we learn something about ourselves every time we slip up or we're not able to meet our goals and as a loved one, you want to normalize that and support them through it it doesn't mean you're going back to to square one but knowing that there can be a lot of anxiety around keeping this up at this stage. So I know that was a really quick overview of stages of change and I could probably talk this whole hour about it, but I wanna make sure that we're also talking about harm reduction. And I, why we're talking about harm reduction is that it is so important for young people to be in control of the changes that they're making um, that you know, that not making big, huge capital C changes are not always um, doable, realistic, desirable for young people. And so um, harm reduction is an evidence based strategy that really fits for youth. Um, it's a set of practical strategies, it reduces negative consequences, it's evidence based, it's client centered, doesn't require right, that big C change. 
Um, it increases control and it's proactive. It keeps people alive and healthy. It doesn't um, demand change all at once. It starts where the young person is at. Um, it's really helpful, especially when youth have, are oppositional. So when we force youth into making these kinds of changes before they're ready, even talking about the changes, um, we get that wall, right? We get, you know, if we're giving all the reasons why they should change, we get all the reasons back why they shouldn't. Um, but harm reduction really promotes this idea of choice in young people. It takes into account mental health. And it's really useful if you're not sure you have buy-in from your loved one. If you're not sure they're fully on board with this idea of treatment or change or thinking about their substance use. Um, harm reduction is different than abstinence. And a lot of people make the assumption that you, you would not have a goal of abstinence even if you're working from a harm reduction standpoint, and that's not true. Harm reduction is a spectrum and abstinence can be on the spectrum, um, on the continuum. But harm reduction is really about focusing on reducing harms, as the name suggests. The goal is on reduction of the substance use. So the end result could be continued use without harm, less use, um, could be you, um, abstinence of one substance, but not another. You know, we have a lot of youth who might say, well, I use weed and alcohol, but alcohol is the real problem for me. I don't really have a problem with weed. I don't want to change that, but I'm willing to look at my alcohol use. And so that's a harm reduction approach to say, okay, let's start talking about your alcohol use. We're not going to, I'm not going to force you to go into, to talk about your cannabis use if you don't think that's a problem for you. Um, and the biggest thing about harm reduction is that it assumes that becoming in control of your use is the goal, whereas abstinence makes the assumption that there is no control, that it's something that takes control away from you, um, and that using any substance uh, negates that idea of control. So the goal is to stop using altogether. Your environment needs to support that. Um, you may need to change behaviors or choices that may promote your use, and that um, there are specific models like AA or NA that are step up, step down, 12-step models um, that support relapses and things like that. Harm reduction is also really important when someone's struggling with their mental health. It recognizes that there are underlying issues that impact substance use. It understands that substances are solutions to problems without safer alternatives and that they can create a psychological safety, especially if someone, let's say, has trauma um, and has a lot of PTSD symptoms, intrusive thoughts, anxiety, um, nightmares, flashbacks, and substances can create a lot of psychological safety or relief from those substances. And harm reduction um, operates from the assumption that any sort of treatment for substance use must include treatment for mental health as well. There are lots of different examples of harm reduction strategies, and I won't spend much time on this. We can talk about ones, you know, at policy levels um, and at the individual level. There, you know, societal uh, harm reduction strategies might be like safe consumption sites or needle exchanges, and individual harm reduction may look like going low and slow. So starting with small amounts, um, slow, you know, and, and not binging or not using too much. It might be making sure you drink water or you eat before you go out, could be methadone or suboxone, could be getting your drugs checked to make sure that they are what you think they are. Um, and, you know, any conversation that we have around harm reduction, you can split the conversation into different categories. There's the what, the why, and the who and the where. And from a harm reduction standpoint, if a youth is interested in talking about the what, so they want to talk about a particular substance and what it, what it is, and um, then we might talk about the particular substance. They may want to talk about the why. You know, I don't have a problem with my cannabis use, but I don't like it when I use alone versus um, to manage my anxiety versus using it to have fun. And I want to stop using it to manage anxiety, but I don't want to stop using it to have fun. Okay, so we might look at the difference between those and focus on um, the goal that that young person has. It might be about the setting. So I don't want to use when I'm alone at home, but I'm okay with using with friends or I don't want to use opiates alone. And my focus is using it safer with other people or when I drink in the bar, not, not COVID 
not related to COVID right now, but if, you know, if I'm drinking in a bar, I tend to binge drink because it's loud and, you know, there's more distractions. But if I'm drinking with one friend, I'm much more aware of what I'm drinking. So looking at the setting and, and how that might impact the choices that we make. There's lots of ways that we may stay safe, that we might work with youth um, to manage. And I, I won't go through all of those. Um, we can definitely talk about it in the Q&A if anyone has any questions. Um, some common concerns for families are on harm reduction. We often don't know enough about it. Um, there's pressure to change and that doesn't always match up with readiness. So how ready I feel as a, as a caregiver might not match how ready you feel as a youth. Um, readiness to change doesn't always match up with availability of support. So I may witness my young person, my loved one being ready to change, but there's no, there are no rehab beds or they have to wait three months for counseling. And those don't always match up. Um, sometimes we have communication breakdowns in our family um, or youth would rather be around their friends than me. Um, taking on risk can be really scary, especially if it's life-threatening. Um, and that, you know, um, I think brings about a lot of fear, hopelessness, helplessness, grief, shame, all of those feelings. Um, a lack of clarity on how much I should be helping or just waiting use. I may feel differently about substances than my loved one. And, and I may be really scared that whatever they're doing now is going to impact them into adulthood. And, and just a reminder, as I always say, the more distress we have, the less self-efficacy we have. And so as a family member, it's really important to look at these things and to figure out how to reduce our distress and our fear. Um, and just a reminder, the validation is always super important in communicating with your loved one. It helps them feel understood. It helps you and them talk about the why, what's the function of their substance use, not the behavior, but the emotion, the why, the what's behind it. So some response strategies, we know that validation communicates our understanding that they're using for a reason, provides opportunities for them to open up. It helps focus on um, coping, which helps, which increases their ability to manage problems without it, meets them where they're at. We don't rush them out of their stage of change and we don't expect them to join ours. Um, and it helps us observe our own limits, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, we always get this question of supporting versus enabling. Um, we tend to get overly involved in someone's use as a way to reduce their harms. This may be helping them get their substances, allowing safe, allowing use in your home or even paying for it. Um, and a lot of our attempts to smooth this path, path for them or reduce their risk sends the message that they're not capable of learning how to manage on their own. And we also run the risk of interfering with a more important adolescent development. Um, that risk taking is a necessary step. Learning from failure, learning from mistakes is a necessary step for getting ready to be an adult. And sometimes we want to reduce the harm. So we get involved, um, but that actually interferes with the learning that some, some level of risk is, is important. So I always get this question of what can I do? Why can't I put fences around my, my child or my loved one's behavior? Why can't I um, do something more about this? And I want to look at the distinction between setting limits and observing limits. Because the truth is we don't always have control um, over the, the choice that they're making. Um, and our attempts to have limits around other people's behavior really depends on whether we have control. A setting of a limit is a decision I make directly to influence your choices and your behavior. It works if I have control. It means I set a consequence if you don't meet my expectation. So the example, you must call me by 10 p.m. for a pickup. Otherwise, you can't go out the next night. You're grounded. That's an artificial consequence that I may set. Well, this works well with um, young, younger teens. Doesn't really work well with older teens who can just leave the house. Um, and they, if they don't like your rule, they might get up and go the next day. Someone who will stay home that you may actually have control over their movements, it might work better. Observing a limit is works best when we don't actually have a lot of control over someone else's behavior. It's a recognition that I can only control my choices and my behavior. And it's something that I can do to manage um, 
what, ha what happens to me because that's what I have control over. So this works much better with older teens and young adults. Um, the example is if you don't call me before 10 p.m. to pick you up, I'm going to bed. You have to find your own way home. So my involvement, I'm putting a limit on my involvement in your choice, not in your choice and your behavior. That's that I don't have control over. And observing our limits is the much more effective strategy around, especially around youth who are using substances and aren't really um, making the choices that you like because we tend to have very little control over, over that. Okay, so I have a bit of time. Um, I thought I had less time and I rushed through the slides. So I'm happy to go back to anything um, that I haven't, that I maybe rushed through. But what can we do in the meantime while we're waiting for change? And uh, for those who have heard me talk before, I've talked about this before, but I think it bears repeating. We are often in a stage of change that is much further along than our loved ones. We want them to stop using. We want them to be better. We want them to be safe. And why do we want that? Because we love them, because we feel helpless or hopeless, or we have fears, um, or we feel powerless to be able to improve their lives. We see them struggling. We see them having problems and we want what's best for them. We love them. But our readiness to change is not their readiness to change. Our, you know, perspective on the world and our place in it or their place in it is different from their perspective and their place in the world. Our coping is different than their coping. And um, that's often where families are missing each other because we're actually talking about two different things. I may be as a parent or a loved one, I may be talking from a place of preparation or action. Um, that I'm ready, I want this to happen now, and for all the legitimate reasons in the world. But my loved one may be talking from a place of pre-contemplation, maybe contemplation, because their ability to, let's say, cope with their mental health through substance use is better or more important or working better than another solution that they don't have any guarantee that that will help. See the difference? They're not as ready as we are. We may have, the truth is we often have the same fears. I'm not gonna grow into adulthood well. I'm not gonna do well. What's my life worth living? Am I going to die? Am I going to get into trouble? Am I going to get hurt? We have the same fears, but how we're equipped to deal with them and whether we feel ready to, and whether we feel confident to are two different things. And that's often where we find um, the disconnect in families. And sometimes we can get back on the same page through talking about it, through learning how to support, through shifting our strategies as a loved one, we may be able to get back on the same page. But sometimes we have to just wait them out. And we can't um, influence them as much as we want. So what can we do while we're waiting them out? We can do things like accept reality. We can focus on the reality we have instead of the reality we want. That's reality acceptance. We can cope, we can do things to help ourselves cope and manage um, and not be bombarded and, and always hyper-focused on the problem. We tend to cope less when we do that. Um, we can decide on priorities. So things I can tolerate, things I can't tolerate. So I may have, you know, those the hard red line of what I'm willing to put up with and, and other things that I'm willing to live with right now. If I have control over things, I can set a limit. Mostly I can observe my own limits so I can decide that line in which I want to get involved, overly involved or under involved, um, depending on how I'm coping, how I'm doing, depending on if it's helping. Right? We often make lots of choices, again, out of um, this place of wanting to reduce harms. And we think we're helping, but it, it's not always actually that helpful, especially if we're interfering with a developmental process, we're interfering with learning. Um, we want them to be able to learn and do it as, um, by themselves. We don't want to become that coping aid or that avoidance strategy. And sometimes our attempts to reduce risk and reduce harm end up becoming that coping aid or that avoidance strategy. 
So observing our own limits is really important. Getting the sleep, eating, you know, maintaining our other relationships, not driving around all night, um, you know, to look for my kid, things like that. Um, and that problem solving only really comes once we've had permission from our loved ones that they want um, us to help them problem solve. Um, those are all things that we can do in the meantime while we're waiting for, for change. Um, I'll give you an example of, of observing limits. Um, years ago, there were these parents that I worked with and um, their son was using a lot of cannabis. He was really addicted to cannabis and he had a lot of anxiety. Um, and if he didn't, you know, he, as soon as he would feel anxiety, he would want to use um, cannabis because it momentarily lowered the amount of anxiety he had. And um, it didn't matter if it was during the day or the middle of the night, if he didn't have any cannabis on him, he would go out and he'd find some. And what he would do is in the middle of the night, he'd ride his bike around town looking for his dealer. If he couldn't find his dealer, he'd, he'd look for other weed. That you know, scared his parents to no end because they worried he was, I think, 15, 16 at the time. And he's riding his bike around in the middle of the night and they really wanted to help him. So what, and they really wanted to reduce the risk. So what they initially had decided was it's safer if they take him around in the middle of the night when he needs weed, when he's feeling anxious, than him riding his bike. So they began to drive him around. Well, what happened is that anytime he needed weed, he was on his parents about driving him around um, to get weed, to find it. And this happened sort of any time of day, any time of night. Um, and so parent, parents became literally and figuratively the vehicle in which he was able to obtain um, his weed and able to cope with his anxiety. Um, but what happens was they were stuck. They were stuck in this role. They couldn't get out of this role. They were exhausted. And um, he wasn't learning any alternative strategies. So with support, we help parents pull back to observe their own limits and to consider where um, supporting was turning into enabling and um, where it was really important uh, to start pulling back. And sometimes he went out in the middle of the night to find weed, but most of the time he actually just learned how to cope in other ways because it wasn't available. It wasn't as convenient and slowly, slower, slower than they wanted. He learned how to cope with anxiety and, and didn't need to use every single time that he uh, felt anxious. Now, I'm sure some of you are sitting there thinking, God, this sounds like me. And that's okay. Like I said, we do these things because they're out of love they're out of concern um, and because we feel helpless and hopeless and powerless and fearful. Um, and it's also okay to start doing a bit of a deeper dive into some of the reasons why we may be choosing to lower risk at all costs um, and to start to think about um, other ways of engaging with our loved ones. So that's a story that I wanted to share with you about observing limits. Um, like I said, sometimes we have control and sometimes we don't have control. And so when we have control, we can act on that. We can um, exercise that control. But when we don't have control, we can accept, 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 accept that we can't influence change and we can't influence the speed of change. We can choose to manage our emotions. We can choose to focus on what we can control um, and we can get help for that. And that's often where I like um, to emphasize. So I, I want to spend the last few minutes talking about something called Rat Park. And I, I wish I had time to show you this video and I don't. So I've included the link um, and happy to send out the resource. Um, but I want to, you know, in the, in the context of harm reduction and talking about substance use, tell you a little bit about Rat Park and some of you may be familiar. Um, so there was this psychologist in the United States who studied rats and addiction. And he initially thought, well, kind of what we all think about addiction, that the more you use something, the more you become addicted to it. And so he would give rats, he'd have, you know, in a cage, he would have a bottle of water and also a bottle uh, that was laced with water, laced with heroin. Um, and in this empty cage with the bottles, the rats love the heroin water and they would drink it and they would die eventually because uh, they would drink toxic levels of heroin. 
But then he started to think about that and he started to think, but there's nothing else in this cage that might mitigate this. And so he made what he called Rat Park. And he created an environment that had toys and wheels and other rats and food and um, the rats could have a great time socializing and, and enjoying other people's company and connecting with other rats or not people rats um, and what he, and they still had the water and the heroin laced water and what he found was those rats were not interested in the heroin laced water not nearly at all that when they had connection when they had when they weren't isolated um, that that was one of the biggest factors that mitigated the consequences of substance use and you know, we really um, developed the premise that what if addiction is about your cage and not just about the substance, that disconnection, isolation and loneliness. And I think we could extrapolate here and talk about, you know, some of the pain, the emotional pain that we have. What if those pieces are bigger factors in why people get addicted to things and why they struggle with their, with their substance use? And that the solution to addiction is not just simply about removing the substance, but about adding back in all of those other pieces that are essential to our well being. That connection, the purpose, the, the reason to get up in the morning, that all of those things are, are even more essential than the actual act of, of using substances itself. And I, I want to leave that with you tonight. I think. You know, it really hits home for me every time that whether we're talking about, you know, harms or substance use or harm reduction or whatever it is, that really the key to all of this is connection. And I hope that you can find that connection with your loved ones um, and help them through to the other side of whatever, whatever difficulty they're struggling with. So I, I think I will end there. I think I'm at one minute before eight and I probably talk too quickly, but um, I'll end there and open it up to questions. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Adina. I'm just gonna change this uh, view so that uh, we can see perhaps me as well. And maybe, uh, maybe we'll just take the slides down as well. Sure so that we can we can see you and me great thank you thank you so much um that was so rich and so nuanced and i think um one thing that i've gotten out of it is that there are no simple straight answers to this right it's not a black and white thing that idea that it goes along a continuum um and uh, there's a real spectrum of how to approach these things and and what you what use looks like and what when it turns into abuse and and so on um so we've got some really really interesting questions and of course they are they're coming in hard and fast now because people <laughs> were riveted listening to you while you were talking um so the first thing i want to ask um is People, people really loved the, the idea of setting limits and observing limits, right? And especially because so many of us are parents talking about, about our kids here. Um, so can you just uh, maybe clarify again this relationship between supporting their use when supporting them in harm reduction turns into enabling? Mm -hmm. And does that mean that we need to then... Like, are we supposed to just draw a line? Are we supposed to say, no, I'm not going to enable this at all. Any, any purchasing for you is, is, is enabling. Um, like, how do we draw the line, right? And you gave, you gave your example, but you were talking about working together with the family to help them find that right position for their family. Uh, so yeah, how do, when you don't have somebody like Adina to sit with and help us figure it out, how do we figure it out? <laughs> well, I, I think it's tough, right? Because when you're sitting with a therapist, of course, the therapist is not emotionally connected to your kid or your loved one. And it's a lot easier to problem solve around these pieces to get the support that you need because you have that emotional distance. If I'm talking about getting my kids to do something differently, I have tons of emotional connection. So like, first off, 
it's so hard to make those distinctions and to decide where that line is when you are feeling all of the feelings around, you know, being afraid and, um, and being desperate and, you know, wanting so badly for them to be okay and not wanting them to die. And, you know, all of those really awful big things. It's always easier when you have someone who's helping you, who, who has that bit of distance. And, and so I want to recognize off that off the bat that, um, these decisions are incredibly difficult and they're not straightforward and where that line is between letting someone experience some of the consequences to, okay, what, you know, I, I've adopted this harm reduction approach, so I'm not going to push them, you know, necessarily to change, but then now all of a sudden we're talking about real risk and I seem to have stepped into a place, you know, of being a helper at the right place should I be this helper should I not be this helper you know um and I think there there are prompting questions that we should always be asking ourselves one is it is it um developmentally appropriate what they're doing and do I have to leave do I have to leave it alone basically if it's relatively safe and developmentally appropriate um if, is it interfering with their development? So is what I'm choosing to help them with going to interfere with them learning something? Well, that's usually a red flag for me as a, as a therapist, right? That if, if what I'm, what the parent parent or, or someone is choosing to do is going to interfere with that individual's ability to learn how to cope or how to get through it, then probably not the best idea. Um, when it comes to paying for substances or even just getting overly involved, you have to think about, do I want this job six months from now? Do I want this job a year from now? Do I want this job five years from now? Because if their decision-making depends on how much I'm willing or not willing to do for them, then I'm always going to be in that position because they're always going to want to use me to manage their decision-making. So it's not about paying for it or not paying for it. I mean, I'm usually on the side of don't pay for it um, for lots of reasons, but I think, you know, you have to ask yourself, do I want to be one of the players in their ability to make their decisions for themselves? Sometimes we say yes, because they're not capable in those moments of doing it without us, or they may, may need to get over the hump and then they'll be fine or they are asking for our help. Though these are all things that we need to consider. And I think that helps us choose. Um, we can do things like a decisional balance exercise, right? We can look at the pros and the cons. Sometimes that helps of um, getting involved versus not getting involved, right? And you wanna look at the pros and cons of getting involved and the pros and cons of not getting involved. So sometimes that can help. But, but those are some of the prompting questions that I think we have to ask ourselves. There's no one, one way to do it, but it's more about what is my role? Am I going to be stuck in this role? And is it interfering with an important task that they need to be figuring out for themselves? And is it interfering with my wellness? And my well-being, you know, we have, there's lots of parents who will, will say, okay, well, this is taking up now all of my time and my energy. And I really haven't talked to my other kids in weeks or my partner, or I'm not getting any sleep or my work is, is suffering. And I think those are all really important considerations that might tell you, no, don't get overly involved because there are other parts of your life that need attention as well. You know, and, and, and the, the same old thing we always say, if you're, if you're not taking care of yourself, you know, this is a marathon. If you sprint the first five miles, you're never going to make it the rest of the marathon. And you want to be there at the end. You want to be beside them. You want to be at all the water breaks. So if you sprint the first five, you're not going to be there. If you want to be there, you got to step out of the way and leave that space for them to figure it out. Cause then all you have to do is, you know, like you're jogging beside them and you need some water, you need some water. You okay. You want to break. Right. And it's much better to be that cheerleader than that person in front of them saying, okay, come here. Okay. I'll do this for you. No, I won't do that for you. Okay. No, no, no. Take these steps ahead, you know, and to be, you don't want to be the director. You want to be the cheerleader. I, lo I love that image of riding alongside. 
<laughs> Thank you. Yeah, with the waters. Yeah, that's how I envision it in my head. Yeah. <laughs> these little these little analogies are so they're so helpful, right? To give you some sort of visual cues and and reminders. Um, so thank you. I think that was that was certainly helpful for me to sort of frame some of the things that we might consider in making that decision and know that it's going to be different for each family. Um, I wanted to ask uh, about the stages of change because you talked a lot about um, the stages of change. We also talk about that during family connections, but it's really important to know what stage they're at. How do we know what stage they're at? Yeah, so I so as I said in the talk, I think it's about paying attention to the type of things you're hearing from them. Those are usually the clues, um, you know, hearing bits and pieces of what we call change talk. So that's like, you know, any language about maybe things could be different or maybe I should try or whatever. Uh, those are sometimes hints that someone is contemplative about change. If you're not hearing any of that, unlikely to be contemplative about change. Um, if they're continuing the same old, same old, even if there are consequences and, and you're hearing things like, I'm fine, I don't need your help, those are usually signs that they're pre-contemplative, right? If you're hearing talk of like imagining a different life for themselves or maybe trying on different change, they're more like much more likely in the further stages of change um, where they're ready. So it's it's about listening for those, those cues and, and observing your loved one um, that might give you a hint. You also may learn it very quickly when you say, Hey, you know, weed's bad for you. And they say, F off, I'm fine. You may, you may, you know, you, you may get a little sense from that too. If you, if you're going in with education and you're getting nowhere, you're getting walls. Or like I said, if you're coming at them with all the reasons they should change and they're just coming at you with all the reasons they should stay the same, it's likely that they're more pre-contemplative and it's likely that your attempts to educate them out of their stage are going to be ineffective. Okay. So a, a lot of, a lot of listening and observing and really paying attention and, and, and watching what's going on and, and, and paying attention to my stage because me as a loved one, I'm, I know what stage I'm in. And sometimes I uh, assume that they're going to come into my stage or they're going to be in my stage and it's not necessarily true. true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, I, I have a really interesting question here. Um, this woman or well attendee refers to a 12 year old um, with a number of different diagnoses, um, anxiety disorder, OCD, mood disorders, um, and has tried a number of medications, psychiatric medications, which haven't been successful. And so the child is now self-medicating using weed and acid. So I, I mean, that that in the particulars is, is very disturbing, but it's not an unusual situation. Lots of youth with mental health issues are going to say, no, no, I don't like the side effects of that psychiatric med. I really like this street drug instead. Um, and I and I get a better boost from it. Right. So how do you how do you navigate that? Yeah. So, I, you know, there's there's two things. I think there's the issue of um, it really sucks when the things that are available to you in terms of safe treatments don't work. And there's a lot to validate there for that, that young person, right? In that, it sounds like there's a lot of difficulty with very little relief and intervention that works and, and there's a lot to validate. Um, we hear a lot from youth um, that recreational substances are more effective. And we know that that's probably the case because psychiatric medications um, you know, have slow uptake into your system for lots of reasons. Um, one of which is safety and substances, you know, street drugs don't have the same safety measures. They usually are much quicker uptake. You feel them faster. You get more of a dopamine rush. It feels better. So they're going to feel more effective. Nothing works as well as, um, recreational substances. Uh, you know, medications are not designed to work like that. Um, and so it, it can be really hard. I think whether you're, you know, a loved one or a clinician, when you're hearing things like that from somebody where they're saying this works better for me, that, that stuff didn't work. I'd rather use, you know, weed, um, or acid or benzos or, you know, that I get off the street or whatever it is. 
because those things are more effective. Um, it usually doesn't work very well to come back at them with education around, you know, anytime I've tried to say, well, you know, do you know what the evidence, you know, like this is the evidence and blah, blah, blah. It doesn't go very far because um, what we're really hearing from young people is they're saying, I need something that's going to work for me. And this is what works for me. And what they're really saying is I'm suffering and I don't have a solution. And so I'm going to pick whatever solution works best. And this is the solution I've worked best. So spending time, you know, um, with that young person to say, again, whether you're a parent or a friend or a therapist or whomever you are, you change your language, but it's the same concept in trying to really understand what it is that they're going through that they believe these are the solutions for. And what are some of the reasons why these feel like more viable solutions than let's say sticking it out with another psychiatric medication. And depending on where they're at in their response and their receptiveness um, to talking about some of the evidence and the truth around that, um, both things are true, right? It's true that those substances probably work faster and better, but it's also true that they have more consequences that we haven't studied the effectiveness in the same way that we have with psychiatric medications that we can't you know, first of all, if you're buying anything off the street, you can't guarantee it's purity. Um, you can't guarantee it's actually the substance you think it is. These are all, you know, when we talk about harm reduction, um, building someone's knowledge and awareness of these pieces so they can keep themselves safe. It may be part of the solution, you know, if it to talk about alternative treatments that might feel more effective than the ones that she sort of, that person is stuck with. But I think it's all in the conversation that we have. And coming back to that, why, right? Why yes, is the why, the, the why it's, it's, that's the most important thing because no one signs up for a life of pain and difficulty. No one says, goes in to using substances saying, I'm going to get super addicted and I'm going to have tons of consequences and I'm going to, I'm okay with struggling to get off of them. Everyone, you know, whether they move from experimentation to regular use and, and misuse, or whether they start off with the intention of feeling better, that's the why, is to feel better. The other stuff is the stuff that comes with it and, and it's the unintended consequence. No one goes in saying, I wanna get super addicted to meth and screw up my life. Nobody does. Um, thank you. Um, so when we've got someone in our life who has reached that point where they are in fact addicted and it's uh, that real struggle and that day-to-day -day struggle of, you know, managing the, the substances and the, and the chemical stuff that's going on in their body, how, how do you interact with that when you've tried to support them through treatment, you've tried to support that person through detox and, you know, they've relapsed. Um, you know, because that happens mm -hmm. and how do you maintain their relationship knowing that this addiction is an ongoing thing and right. has all these impacts on there? So I really hope that you'll all check out that video at the end of um, my talk rat park and I, we can put the link to it maybe in the chat, um, as well. Um, because the speaker talks about his, his experience with people in his life who have addictions. Um, and that's really why he got into it. That's why he started learning about, about Rat Park and all of those other things. And he talks about, you know, there's, there can be so much anger and so much frustration with people in your lives who are struggling with substance use, but that um, we really have to find a way to love them no matter what. But it doesn't mean, and this is not him, this is me, I also don't think it means that we have to forego um, our limits and our sanity and our well-being and all of those things just to be able to love someone because it's hard to love someone who's really struggling with addiction. It's hard to, to continue to love someone and sit with them and, um, and be with them as they, they engage in things that feel like really stupid choices, really risky choices that, that might be ruining their lives, that might um, be impacting our lives. And so it is incredibly okay and important and essential to have limits in your relationship with someone if you need those limits to make it through the marathon. If you want to have a relationship with this person, 
in the long run. It's okay to find ways where you're going to pull back, to take that relationship vacation, to make that space so that you're able to cope when their lives and your relationship with them doesn't look the way that you want it to, or doesn't feel the way that you want it to. If you need to take that step back and not get involved with the ins and outs of their use, because that helps you support them more and validate them more, then go ahead. Don't get involved with the ins and outs of their use. If you know, sometimes knowing too much creates a lot of distress and a lot of pain. And so a lot of parents that I work with, they get to the point where they actually don't know so many details anymore. And that's a good thing. And they aren't so involved in those pieces. And they've observed these limits for themselves. They've pulled back so they can maintain the relationship. For other people, it's not living with them anymore. For other, you know, other family members, it's finding a way to have connection that has nothing to do with substance use. And really holding on to that piece and holding on to that connection or that ritual or that whatever it is that that we don't talk about the problem. You know, youth, when we, you know, we have so few opportunities, I think, to connect with, with our young people, you know, with your kids or with people in your lives who are young, they're all, you know, other than in COVID, but normally they're all over the place or out of the house most of the time, right? You don't see them, you don't interact with them. So there are so few opportunities you really feel you have to make an influence. And what happens is we talk about the problem every single time because we say, oh, here's my chance. Okay, here's my chance. I have to influence them. I have to make sure that they know it's bad. Don't do it, you know. But what happens is so now every single time you're interacting with your loved one, all you're doing is focusing on the problem or you're finding a place to weave it in, right? You're like listening for it and you're like, oh, here's my chance. Okay, now I'm going to mention it. And what happens is they don't want to actually be around you because you, you never not talk about their problem. They're painfully aware of their problem. They're thinking about it all the time. What they need is time with you that has nothing to do with the problem. And just to sit and, and to enjoy and to have rituals and have relationships and, and to it not be their identity with you is not all about the struggles that they're having. And so finding a, a way to carve that out. Maybe you talk about the problem every three times or, you know, you, you know, you sit on your hands, so you don't do it all the time, or you, you, you do whatever you need to do to cope so that you have space and time with your loved one that doesn't um, constantly highlight the, the challenges that they're having, because that can get, that can really start to interfere both with your relationship with them, with how they feel about you, but how you feel about them. And again, if you want to you know, be waiting for them at the end of this marathon and come out the other side, you want to be in the mood to cheer them on. You don't want to, you know, resent being there. Mm -hmm. So what do you need to do to get to a place where you're still cheering them on at, you know, mile marker 22, I actually don't know how long marathons are. That's embarrassing. I think they're 26, 26. Um, (laughs) Thank you. I'm clearly not a runner. Um, but you, you know, you want, you, you don't want to get to that place where you don't want to be there anymore. And you, they want you there, even if they can't articulate it. That's, that's really lovely and really hopeful. It's about setting those, setting that priority and recognizing that you do want to be there in the long run. Thank you. Um, I'm going to find one more question and then maybe Kathleen has some from the chat. Um, one thing that comes up a lot that tugs my heartstrings is what do you do as a caregiver or a family member when you feel like you're the only one who's there for your, for your kid, right? Because the services aren't there and you feel alone and you're caring it all. Yeah. Oh, that's gotta be the worst place to be and the place of most pain. And I would say find someone, anyone, whether it's peer support, whether it's something like Sash Bear, someone else, they may not get it, but they might get you, you know, and find someone who can have empathy for you. You know, the, I saw a definition of empathy today that um, it doesn't necessitate us in having the same experience as the other person to have empathy for them. And so you don't need someone who gets it. You don't need to, you don't need someone in your life who has a similar situation. You need someone who you can say, oh my gosh, I'm having the worst day. And they might say, tell me about it. Or, oh, that sounds awful. Um, You know, it doesn't have to be a parenting partner. It doesn't have to be another family member. We want so badly in our lives to know that the people are close that are that we're closest to are on the same page with us in terms of what we want and how we want to support our loved ones but the truth is sometimes they're not 
Um, and I think this is, you know, we go back to this idea of reality acceptance, that reality acceptance is about the reality we have currently, not the one we want. And it may not be the person you want who to support you, and it may not be the way that you want to go about this, but um, if you can find someone, anyone who has empathy for you, and maybe you need to find that in yourself, maybe you need to have empathy for yourself if you are truly alone right now. Um, you know, I think there are, you know, the internet can be a bad place, but it can also be a wonderful place where you can find communities and you can find, you know, even reading someone's story of how they've gone through this, that can be really validating. There are lots of ways that we can find hope and connection. There just may not be the, the top one that we want or the one we expect to have. But the truth is there's lots of ways to feel heard and to feel connected um, out there. So it's not just about the person who's using substances finding that connection, but for us to find it as well. Absolutely. Um, Kathleen, do you have a question from the chat that you would like to have Adina answer? Not sure if Kath Kathleen was actually having trouble with her internet as well. So she may have dropped off the call again. Or Lizanne? Wow, there's there. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah, there are incredible questions and comments. It's it's hard to just pick one. Um, I um, hold on a second. I wonder if you could talk a bit about. Sorry, just one second. I got to get my other notes in front of me here. Um, Kathleen, feel free to jump in. If you have a moment, but you know we're. And, and I wonder if you've already answered this too, but just with COVID, let's, let's look at that, that um, question. And, you know, with the loss of so many other coping techniques, how, um, you know, are there, how do we adjust how to support our loved ones um, and, and distinguish the difference between say pro problematic um, use versus harm reduction right and, or addiction like where is that where is that distinguish how do you distinguish what's problematic and, and what's addiction and right um, yeah harmful. well i think in the context of covid most substance use is going to look problematic or a reflection of addiction because our um, more normal ways of using are not available to us right going to going to well, for older, for older young adults going to a bar or hang out with friends in a park or, um, you know, using after school, which some youth do lots of ways that may not actually be that problematic, but youth don't have access to because they don't have access to these typical um, social spheres that they normally find themselves in. And not to mention that kids are now at home all the time, um, which will, um, you know, a lot of things are coming to light. Parents are becoming more aware of things that they probably didn't notice before uh, because youth weren't home. Um, and so I think it's really important, you know, and again, to go back to this idea that the more you can communicate with your loved one and learn about their experience, the more you'll understand about their experience and you'll be able to differentiate between what's problematic and what's not. They're the source, they're the expert. They know why they're using and they know how they're using and the context. Um, you may be more aware of things happening right now, or we may interpret it as more problematic, but I, for some use, it's still not problematic. And for others now it is because they have lost a lot of um, other pieces of their lives that are really important. And, and so their use could be getting worse, but um, we can't just go on our observational skills. Um, we need to actually communicate with our loved ones to understand again, their why. Why is that they're using what's changed as a result of COVID for them? Um, and, you know, as a, a plug for my earlier talk, um, if you have to have the foundation in your relationship to be able to have those types of conversations, to be able to go in in this place of trust and openness and validation so that they actually want to tell you their problems and they feel that that's a safe place to do it. Um, and so 
that's the goal is to get in there and to hear from your loved one about what's happening to them, especially now with COVID. You know, I, I think initially we, even kids were reporting that they were okay, you know, like things felt safe at home and they were okay. But now a year in, um, we don't really know how they're doing and you got to find out, you got to talk to them, got to make space for it. And then you got to leave them alone because now also that privacy, that space that they once had that space to, to, you know, move towards independence. It's been, it's been altered and, and halted by COVID and they're stuck at home doing all of these developmental leaps in front of you, which normally they would do without you. Um, and so then you also have to give them space that sometimes, you know, those cramped quarters now uh, can actually make it difficult to engage in some of these developmental tasks. Thank you. Um, I have a number of questions that are showing up around how do you define addiction? What's the difference between addiction and problematic use? Does it matter if it's heavy use or moderate use? Right. Is cannabis use disorder the same as an addiction? Does the does the nomenclature even matter? <laughs> well, like, yes and no. I think, you know, labels are only have limited benefit. Um, it, again, you know, back to those criteria of um, what constitutes a substance use disorder and knowing what is true for your loved ones. So are they using more than what they're intending? So someone may use 10 drinks and someone may use two drinks, but two might be more than they're intending to, and that might be too much for them. And 10 might be actually not such a big deal for someone. Um, you know, I, I know youth who are using half a gram of weed a day and say, this is really problematic for me. I really want to change this. And other youth are using three to four grams a day. And they're saying, this is really problematic for me. I need to change this. So it's not about the, the quantity or, um, but it's about what function it's having in their lives. Is it interfering in with obligations like school or work or relationships? Are they building a tolerance to it? And, and are they struggling to change that? Do they experience withdrawal? All of those things are signs of disorder, um, but it really is about the function of the substance use, if it is interfering. If it's not interfering, then we're not necessarily talking about disorder. Um, it could be that they are engaging in experimentation in really developmentally appropriate ways. Even someone who binge drinks, at a party, feel sick the next day, it doesn't mean that they have a disorder. It doesn't mean that there's anything wrong. There's something really normal about young people, you know, recreationally using substances. That was true for us. That's true for them. Nothing's really changed. Um, but if other problems are surfacing as a result, if they're unable to meet their obligations, and if they're unable to stop, those are usually the signs that we're talking about disorder and not just use. Um, and again, you know, why, the why, I keep coming back to the why. If they're using because it's enjoyable and pleasurable and they have fun with their friends, probably not as big of a deal. If they're using to, to sleep, if they're using to lower anxiety, if they're using to quiet their thoughts, a bit of a bigger deal because now it's tied to their mental health. And that, that sounds more like a coping aid versus something that they could take or leave at any time. The more we use a coping aid, the more we start to rely on it, the more we start to believe we can't do without it. And the, the more struggle we have in, co in coping. And coping is, I'm sorry to say, but the most important thing we'll do in our lives. Life is not about the absence of pain and suffering. It's about the tolerance of it. We need to cope. We, we, we can't create a life where we don't suffer. So it's kind of the most important thing. I'm going to, I'm going to just draw on that. And then I, I think whatever you respond to this will be where we close, but um, there's a lot of comments as well that, that have come up from people saying like, I feel like it's really difficult for me to wait for my kids to get to the point where they're ready to change. Or how do I, how do I cope with knowing the risk all of, all of this stuff around this when I'm trying to be patient and understanding because it's painful and hard for us as parents. Yeah. And so I think, you know, the formula is not all that different. It's, we have to accept reality. 
We can't push for change before someone else is ready. And that's true for ourselves as well. We need to find support and comfort through other means. We need to pull back and have limits, right? Observe our limits to ensure our well being. We need to take care of ourselves and we need to find a way to wait. You know, think about any change that you've ever made in your life. The reason that we change is because the prospect of changing outweighs the prospect of staying the same. And that doesn't happen until we're ready. We can't force anybody to be ready for something before they are. And we can't force them to change before they are. It might like happen a little bit, but it's not going to be genuine. And they're more likely to, to um, uh, move backwards and not sustain that change. We change when we're ready. And when we see that um, life is worth living on the other side, even with the risks, then what it is currently for us. And the same is true if we can apply that to our coping. We will cope if we know that coping will be worth it over not, it not being worth it. And you will get through it just like you get through it every day. It's hard, but life is not about the absence of pain and suffering. It's about the tolerance of it. We all find a way to do it and we all make it through the other side. You know, no feeling is permanent. Feelings change, they shift, they turn, they morph into other things. And we also learn to let go of some of the pain. And that is the same, that is true about this as well, is the more you do it, the more you, you will naturally learn how to tolerate it. And you will wait them out until they're ready because you have no other choice. Thank you so much. I really do think that's a great place to leave it for tonight. And uh, we've just gone two minutes over our allotted time. So that was, that was great. Thank you again so very, very much, Adina, for being here with us. I know that hundreds of families were helped and really, really appreciate the time that you took to be here. Um, thanks to Lizanne and Kathleen for having supported us through this work that we have done tonight. Uh, remind you that we are uh, the Sash Bear Foundation. Um, if you're interested in the Family Connections Program, or if you are wanting to find out about other resources or find out about the recordings of these webinars that we've got, you can go to our website at www.sashbear.org. Thank you again, Adina, and I wish everybody a good night. Thank you very much for having me.